Good afternoon, my name is Paula Rogers and I'm the CEDA State Director for Western Australia. I welcome you to today's event, Cybercrime, What are the New Threats? It's been live streamed because like many organisations, CEDA has suspended attendance at public events. The health and safety of participants, members and staff are our priority, and we are adhering to and supportive of the requirements for government for today's discussion. At this time of significant economic uncertainty, CEDA remains true to its purpose of providing platforms to inform and promote debate of critical issues, and that is why this event is being made available as a live stream. Over coming months, we will be making a range of events across key issues available in digital formats to ensure CEDA members and the community more broadly can access discussions on the most important issues impacting Australia's economic and social development. Details will be on the CEDA website, ceda.com.au, and I encourage you to look out for those updates. There will also be regular podcasts and video interviews available on the websites with leading experts and policymakers to ensure you can remain up to date with quality information on the key issues impacting the economy. Today, you will still be able to interact with speakers through our Q&A portal, which is available via the link on your screen. Click the link and you can add your questions for our speakers and they will then be provided live to our facilitators on stage. We will also be doing a live poll during the event with the question, do you believe your organization is cyber secure? Results will be shared in the post event email. To start our event, CEDA would like to acknowledge that today and every day we meet on Aboriginal land. We are committed to recognition and reconciliation. We respect elders and support their stated aspirations. A special thank you for today's major sponsor, Edith Cowan University, or ECU, for their support and commitment to this event. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to those online, as well as our speakers who are experts in the cybersecurity field, drawn from across government, industry, and academia to lead this important discussion. Our keynote speaker today is David Singleton, Chief Executive Officer from Austral, Joining David for the panel conversation will be Jeff Campbell, Cyber and Information Security Officer, Horizon Power, Rochelle Fleming, Chief Business and Marketing Officer, Sapien Cyber, Anthony Fisk, Executive Director, CGM Communications, and Dr. Ian Martinez, Director, WA Aus Cyber Innovation Hub. Facilitating today's discussion will be Professor Andrew Woodward, Executive Dean, School of Science, Edith Cowan University. The full bios of our speakers are available online. It now gives me great pleasure to invite David Singleton to deliver his keynote address. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, uh, I was asked, um, I think it must be oh, 12 months ago now, um, by Paula to, um, to give an address to this audience about an event that happened here at Austal um, about 18 months ago, a cyber event um, that you may have, you may remember from um, from news at the time. And uh, let's see whether I can share my screen. I'm struggling at the moment. Um, Paula said to me, you know, would you be prepared to share your story with others? And after a little consideration for a few moments, I thought, you know what, I, I will. And today, it feels a little bit like the kind of in a very small way, a bit like the Harvey Weinstein um, Me Too affair, um, in that, you know, the, the, this is us talking about something that happened to us. It was very physical in many ways um, and, and affected us. And, and I think by getting more people involved and, and talking about and understanding some of these things, um, we might actually be able to push back on some of the issues that are happening. Um, if I could ask the, the host in the background, I'm having trouble um, sharing my screen. I think you've got it switched off. Um, I titled my presentation today, um, How to Make a Bad Year uh, Worse, and, and to do with cybercrime. And of course, at the moment, all of us are thinking a lot about a very large scale event that's occurring in the world um, right now. And we're all 
we're all vulnerable to um, cybercrime, but you know, arguably we're more vulnerable now um, than we normally are. We've got people working at home. We've got people thinking about different things. Um, we've, we've got a lot of communication going through the internet, perhaps more than we normally would have. And as a result of that, that um, is making um, that that's making it. Uh, more vulnerable for us um, who, are, who are working as a result of working online. Um, and so it feels like now is a, is a good time to be thinking about um, some of these matters because these people don't, these people that carry out these crimes do not respect borders and they don't respect um, the fact that uh, we have other things going on in our, uh, in our minds at, at, at the moment. The good news, I think, is what I discovered as a CEO through this is there's a great deal that we can do um, that any of the very significant things um, that we did uh, cost us nothing at all. Let me just bring this slide up. Yeah, it cost us nothing at all. And so we were able to use some of the capability that we had um, in our business in order to um, bring greater levels of, um, of uh, protection to our business. Let me just, there we go. Okay, good. Um, the first thing uh, that came to me was when I was thinking about this presentation, I almost felt like uh, it was like being at Alcoholics Anonymous. And if there are any press on board, I don't want you to print that particular admission, but it felt like I should be saying, you know, I'm David, I'm from Austell, I'm an alcoholic. Well, I'm not actually an alcoholic, but um, I have been through something that feels exactly like, like that. It feels like something, some dirty secret that you have that you don't really want to admit to. And that's why I think it was important to, um, uh, to go through this today and, and I felt like it was it was an issue that no one else should have to go through because this is not uh, this is nothing else than plain criminality it's just criminality and um, through a different uh, means and when we use the word cyber it feels like it's a little bit cool a little bit sophisticated a little bit techy let me tell you when you're subject to cyber crime in this way there's nothing cool about it it's just like being mugged and taken down to the cash register and forced to pay money um, to somebody. That's exactly how it feels uh, in your mind. So before I get going, I thought I might just tell you a little bit about um, the company. Um, we, uh, we're Australia's largest um, shipbuilder. Uh, we will build uh, nearly $2 billion worth of ships around the world uh, this year, have an order book of 4.3 billion. We have 41 different ships in seven different shipyards in five different countries um, under uh, construction around, around the world. But I thought I can speak for, as you can imagine, I can speak for a long time about Austo and I don't, I don't want to do that. So I wanted to try and just characterize the business for you um, quickly to think about um, what this business is. And if you think about the air space, the fastest uh, aircraft in the world are these fighter aircraft. This is the F-35 um, jet, uh, fast, one of the faster aircrafts in the world, about 2,000 kilometers an hour um, for a vessel, or, uh, for a um, uh, aircraft of this type. It's made out of carbon fiber, it's lightweight, and it's optimized for the air domain. It's also ex extremely expensive. These are $110 million a piece, uh, roughly, in the largest defense program ever, uh, ever conducted. One and a half trillion dollar, that's a trillion dollar, not billion dollar, one and a half trillion dollar program. We think about um, uh, roads and we think about uh, the supreme sort of cars on the road are these supercars. This is a Ferrari, of course. Um, this car uh, does, uh, 350 kilometers this is a hybrid car does 350 kilometers an hour costs you three to four hundred thousand um, dollars compared to sixty thousand dollars maybe for a standard car it's highly adapted to the road it's a lightweight carbon fiber um, car then you look at what Austell do and this is what Austell does uh, our vessels are the fastest vessels in the sea domain anywhere around the world this is the literal combat ship 
for the United States Navy, just one of the vessels that we, we produce. It's a trimaran hull. It's highly optimized for the sea environment to reduce uh, friction in the water. It uses water jets instead of propellers. And this vessel is the fastest ship in the United States Navy. It can go over 43 knots, um, fully laden. Uh, that's where Austal fits in, very much the Ferraris of the ocean. Uh, these are made out of aluminium, not carbon fiber, but they are absolutely the fastest ships um, in that large vessel domain anywhere around the world. So that's a characterization, if you like, of this, uh, of this company and why it's been so successful in the market that these been in. So let me get back to um, cyber. And uh, what was interesting for me was this whole field to me as a CEO was a bit like a sort of a parallel universe. It was, it was a bit like sort of going to Hogwarts in, the, in that there was a whole um, universe around cyber and particularly um, cyber warfare and the criminal element of cyber that felt like it was a universe parallel to our own, one that I didn't understand, I had very little knowledge on. You know, people talk about the dark web, a place where criminals hide, where criminality is, uh, is rife, this sort of parallel area. And the criminals live in this dark, dark web. I still don't really know what it is. I can, kind of, I can kind of think about it, but I really don't know exactly what it is. I don't understand how you get around in this, in this dark web that's not signposted in the same way as some sort of parallel universe. And, um, and here in this parallel universe, you can buy passwords, you can buy company addresses and you can buy the passwords that go with those addresses and you can use those passwords to enter somebody's system. And that's what happened to us at Austell. And I was told by people who know this environment much better than me, this is not unusual, that many companies have, uh, people have stolen passwords and then posted them onto the dark web in order that people can then buy them for them to actually to, to undertake their element of the criminality. And that's what happened to us. Um, and so somebody bought passwords from the internet. And then it felt like this. It was a weekend. It's a Sunday afternoon and someone had bought a password and they accessed our systems here um, in, uh, in Austell and they entered our electronic building and they walked through straight through the front door and they were in the core um, of the building that uh, the electronic building that we, we operate. And then they did this. Once they got through the front door, they then walked around the house from room to room, going from one place to another, one virtual server to another virtual server, from one real server um, to another. And uh, whilst those doors should have been locked on the inside of our, of our house, uh, they weren't. And somebody was able to move through um, quite easily. And that criminal walked around those virtual rooms in our house and he collected um, things as he went. He collected data and he collected information. We were in very many ways fortunate in that uh, on the wall in our uh, main living room was a Rembrandt, a very expensive Rembrandt. What he actually ended up doing was stealing the TV set, which is highly replaceable and of less value. And so we were fortunate in many ways, but fortunate only by luck. In fact, the way that we found out what was going on was none other than he took information from rooms inside the house, loaded them into a particular area, a particular memory drive from which he was then extracting out of that memory drive to the, to the outside. And he overloaded the memory drive. And as a result of overloading the memory drive, it set off an alarm late on, late on a Sunday night when everybody was um, away from the office, it set off a memory alarm. And that was the first trigger that we had that something was, was, was amiss and, um, and going on. And when I came into the office early on a Monday morning, I got a call early on the Monday morning, you need to come in, you need to come in straight away. Um, we were in the midst of a recovery action to try and deal with the issue with CERN. Um, 
So I'll move on a little bit to uh, what we did when uh, when we found that that Monday morning, and it's it's quite an unprecedented time um, because it's something that you're you're not used to. It's something that's not normal a normal part of your life, and yet it's act, it's happening really really fast. It's in fast. It's in real time, and it's and it's happening um, while you are in the room. There's data moving. Um, people moving around inside the house while you're while you're there. And you just imagine if this was your own house and you came home late at night and you saw the front door had been smashed off. At that point, you have no idea whether somebody is still in the house, whether things are still being stolen, indeed what has been stolen so far. And that's how we felt on that on that Monday morning. We didn't even know if the individual had left the premises or whether he was still inside you know, our virtual systems. So the first thing we did was to lock the system up and the IT department were able to move really quickly on that. They shut down all the external ports, made sure that no more information could move in or out. No emails could move in and out. None of our employees um, could access the internet and do their normal roles. Now, this is where I say that things start to move very quickly because then it becomes very obvious. All of a sudden, hundreds of your employees know that there's something amiss. They can't get an email out. They can't get an email back. They can't access anything. And there's a demand to, to understand what's going on. And the urgency of the situation is increasing uh, moment by moment. After a few hours, you start to get um, suppliers ringing in and other people ringing. What's going on? You know, we, we're not getting any information out of you. Why can't, we, why can't we send you some data? So things start to start to move very, very rapidly. And you have to be um, ready for that. What we did was we called our insurance um, company because we had uh, an IT policy. And they, um, to show you the urgency of it, they sent somebody from the UK immediately. Within four hours of us placing a call to our insurance company, they had somebody on, the, on a flight in London um, coming down to Perth um, to help us with the, um, with the recovery action. Um, and the reason for that is that they knew better than anybody that the speed of this, the lightning speed of what's going on is so profound that you have to react to it quickly um, to minimise the damage. The reason for the hack became very clear very quickly. A uh, hacker had arrived. He made a ransom demand. Um, this, was, this was just plain criminality. This was an individual who just wanted to extort money for the company in order to return um, data. And the way he did that was he sent an email to 50 or 60 people in the organization and he said, you've been hacked. These are the bitcoins I need for me to return the data um, that I have stolen. Fortunately for us, as I said earlier, we hadn't lost our Rembrandt, we'd lost our TV set and, uh, and we weren't in a mind at all to deal with um, extortion. So I thought I might turn, my, turn uh, what I'm gonna say now really to what we did um, post, that of, post that very traumatic event, not only at that, at, at that point in the beginning, but what, what came afterwards and, and how that helped us. The first thing is we went through um, what I like to think of as a spring clean. So at that point, we had no idea what was going on inside of our systems. We didn't know whether somebody had put a bug in there. We didn't know whether our data was being eaten away and destroyed um, quickly. We didn't know whether um, that somebody had left some back doors in so they could come along um, later on. And uh, we got two pieces of help um, to sort that out. First of all, the insurance company sent their expert down and they loaded software through our system to try and find whether anything untoward was happening. And secondly, we'd contacted the Australian Cyber Security Centre who were particularly helpful. And, and I would say to any of you, if you get in this, um, if, if you get into this situation, do contact them. The head of the Australian Cyber Security um, became a good friend of mine as a result of this um, that particular event. And what they did essentially was to lock the doors, clean the rooms, um, and deal with the after effects of what had happened. We were particularly happy, I have to say, that um, about a year before, we'd moved our data and our systems um, to the cloud. 
So that helped enormously because uh, it made us really confident that we had backup files um, going back as far as, as we needed to go because of the quality of the services that we could get from there. So we were never ourselves in a position where we were worried about losing our core data. Um, and that was a great relief to me because the idea that you could lose vast swathes of data because it's been eaten by some malignant bug um, you know, would have, would have been a pretty scary, um, scary idea. Um, so it, it was a lesson to me that the move to the cloud for us had been really important in, in us being able to stabilise the situation quickly and be able to move on. Um, we then went to look at passwords. Now, you remember I said at the beginning that the thing that had caused the problem was, um, was passwords. And um, immediately after the event, bearing in mind now, all of our employees knew what had happened and they knew it was as a result of passwords. And we forced two password changes. So everybody had to change their passwords twice over, over a 24 hour period. And then at the end of that, we ran, a, uh, we ran a routine that allowed us to look through everybody's passwords in the company. And there were 40 versions of these two passwords, which taught me something really important in all of this, is that the weak link in any system um, can often be your people. Even after a cyber break, people were using password one, two, three and Austal one, two, three as a password, the very passwords that had gotten um, cyber criminals into the system in the first place. And so the first uh, step we made was to put in a new piece of software, relatively cheap software, it's very available. Um, you, can, you can put this into your system, um, which allows you to use, which makes the system demand much more complex software uh, uh, passwords than, than these. So we now have a regime in the company where uh, the passwords are complex, they are changed frequently, and you can't use the, the password twice. The, the normal Microsoft operating system doesn't have that piece of software in it, and it was something we bought and installed uh, really quickly from an Australian company, as it turned out. The next thing we did, and this was really cheap and effective thing to do, is we turned on the multi-factor authentication process inside, uh, inside the Windows environment. That's always been there. It's free. It was free in our system. Uh, we just hadn't utilised it. And this means that when somebody goes to log in from outside of the company, um, they, get, they get asked to authenticate that by an SMS message or some other message that goes through to their mobile phone. I'll tell you later that this is, has been uniquely important in preventing further accesses into our system um, since then. And this is free. Remember, I'll just say that again. It's free. In our system, it existed. It's easy to do. It's straightforward. Um, as a CEO, I couldn't do it, but um, there are plenty of people that can do that and do that relatively um, quickly. The next thing we did was we not only did we put the lock on the outside of the, of the business, but we started to put locks on all of the internal rooms in our virtual system. So all of the servers, the virtual servers and, and the different parts of our system, we locked those um, independently. Some of them are locked really tightly. So areas where um, there is particular concern, but let's take an example, employee data. Um, we put multi-factor authentication on that part of the server. We also limited the number of people who could access that part of the server much more to a much smaller number than we had previously done. And we have an audit process in place that makes sure we go back and we check those names um, continuously for that particular area of our system so that only those that absolutely have to be in those parts of the system um, have access to it. So that means that if somebody got through the front door again, their ability to move around the system and gather more data is now um, much more limited than it, than it would have been before. Again, relatively straightforward, very easy, um, almost uh, without cost, a way of limiting the damage that happens when somebody moves um, inside. No different to when you lock your office door um, when you leave at night. The other thing we recognised was a risk was, in, was um, USBs. And there is so much data on our systems that this was a hack that came from outside of our organisation, but it could equally have come 
from inside of our organization and, and we could have had data that was removed on USBs that have a large amount of capacity there. Again, very simple fix for us because in the Windows Enterprise environment, you can turn encryption on, you can turn USB drives off on individual computers and you can turn encryption on so, so that data um, can only be transferred onto USBs in an encrypted format so that it can't be easily read um, by others. A very straightforward and simple thing. It's a much better measure than a measure I saw in Saudi Arabia some years ago where the boss of that particular business went around all the USBs and he filled them uh, with super glue so that people couldn't put um, USB drives in because he recognized the vulnerability of, um, of the USB um, drive. Now you could Superglue is probably just as uh, cheap as um, turning them off. It does a whole deal more damage. Then having done all of that, the question I asked myself um, was, how do I know that we've now locked the house up securely? And when I think about my home, I can go around at night and I can check the windows and I can check the doors. I can check the alarm systems being turned on correctly. All of these things I can, I can see. But in the virtual world, as a leader in a business, you can't see that. You don't, you don't know that you have actually uh, haven't left something open. And remember, these cyber criminals are experts at finding the little, the little gap that you've left open. So one of the things we did was uh, penetration testing. We got an external um, company to come in and do penetration testing and test whether our systems um, were robust enough to deal with a, another attack. And I'll tell you an interesting story. When they tried to attack our systems as we had updated them, they couldn't get in. When we let them in and asked them to try and wander around from room to room, they couldn't wander around. The next thing they did was they sent an individual to walk into the site who managed to, he was an expert at this, managed to gain entry to the site. And he had a handful of USB drives. And he went around our organization and he asked people to put a USB drive into their computer to check the data that was on it. And on that USB drive was a piece of malware that he had specifically put on um, that, that showed that he'd been able to do that. He then left a USB drive in our IT department. And somebody in the IT department picked up the USB drive and put it in their computer and also transferred the malware onto our system. So again, it taught us the importance of not only electronic security, but also physical security in our environment as well. And I'll tell you something that the head of the Australian Cyber Security said to me at the beginning of all of this. He said, you need to remember all the way through this process you are going to go through that you are the victim because what will happen is you will be shamed as a victim, that people will start to point to you as being the problem. It's your fault. He described it to me as some of those really unfortunate stories we've heard in the past of judges who have uh, apportioned some element of blame to people who've been um, uh, the victim of crime. You know, why were you out at two o'clock in the morning in, in that particular area of town? You know, you were asking for it. And that's exactly what happens in this environment. You know, I got called up by the Australian government to go and explain myself to the Australian government, to very senior ministers in the, in the Australian government about how we had managed to be hacked when we have defence information on our site. Um, and, and you start to get an, you start to create an environment where you know, people forget you were the victim and start to think you were in some way the perpetrator. And so, as I said at the beginning, when I talked about the sort of me too environment, maybe one of the things that um, you know would be good out of this, and certainly the reason why I talked about um, doing this presentation today, is that if enough people talk about um, the pain of this, the difficulty of this, the cost of cleaning up afterwards, the disruption to your business, and to us it was relatively light, then maybe more people will do some of these simple things that I've talked about that really can make a fundamental um, difference. Because it looks like this when you turn up on Monday morning 
and you've had a hack over the weekend and within seconds the tsunami comes in over the top of you and engulfs your business and it became really the only thing that we concentrated on for weeks afterwards and i've seen some other you um, other australian businesses recently in the same position where their whole business gets dominated um, by the hack so i have one last a uh, couple of last slides that i'll just um, finish with and and th this is the only one with words on um which was intentional because i just wanted to say two or three what i think are really simple things that leaders and and people inside an organization can do to reduce the risk um, associated with a cyber hack first is just assume that everyone knows your passwords because once you assume that people have a way to get in the front door, it changes the way you think about what you're going to do. Remember, you've got several hundred people working for you. In our case, you know, a thousand people in Australia, 6,000 people in, in total. Any single one of those people can give their password accidentally or intentionally to someone else. So assume the passwords are known and react accordingly to that. That really leads you to multi-factor authentication. If you use multi-factor authentication, it's free. Use it, it makes a hell of a difference. Secondly, consider going to the cloud. The um, security environment, the, the, um, the encryption, the ability to, to um, copy uh, files back, back into, into history in that environment, it's so much better than what you're able to do at the moment. Um, Amazon Web Services, um, I saw recently, spending a billion dollars a year just on security um, around their software systems. And that's a, that's an environment that you can uh, you can take advantage of. Um, know, uh, know who is at the door of the house and be able to lock that and also lock um, the areas inside and use an alarm. We now have uh, software inside our virtual systems that tells us if anyone's moving around inside the business and i know some of the some of the people representing here today represent businesses that provide that software this is a monitoring system like, almost like an alarm system inside your house if somebody gets through the outer layer of your defense system even then they can be seen if they're moving around the house and the last point was protect your data um, and usb drives are a real risk uh, in all of that and then my last slide, which is just a wake up call is this. This is a uh, copy of an email on the left hand side that arrived in our organization only a week ago. Um, it arrived on a number of, number of people's um, drives. Now you look at it and you say, well, I can see that that's a, uh, looks like a spam email. The uh, project engineer from Lithuania, an area that we don't do any business, um, just doesn't feel right. What happened was um, the click, download the proposal click, 40 people in our organization in the first hour clicked on that download proposal. When you go to that download proposal, it asks you to put in your um, email address and your password. Believe it or not, after all that had happened to us, five people put in their email address and password, which get, would have given them access to the system and the thing that saved us was the multi-factor authentication okay thank you um it, normally at a time like this i'll be throwing my hands up in the air and i know you'd all be clapping righteously um and i <laughs> i can't hear anything so i'm going to pass you over now to uh andrew woodward who uh, is from Edith cowan university great thanks very much david um, look, there's some really great points there, and thank you very much for relaying that story to us. Um, I think there's a few, I think, really key points there for uh, everybody. I think in particular the point you made about uh, cyber crime, in particular these are just cyber criminals, is really important to remember that. Um, they're not, we, we don't use the term hackers, they're cyber criminals, and, and that's a really important thing. They just want to get your money no matter what you do. Uh, and secondly, that the human factor is really always a key important thing. But I guess lastly, as you discovered, fortunately, in some cases, a lot of cyber criminals and criminals are pretty stupid, which um, saved you in this instance and um, certainly in some instances others, but you can't always rely on that. 
uh, at Edith Cowan University um, as leading cyber security research and uh, education training institute. We um, have a particular interest in this area and certainly um, there, as it relates to critical infrastructure. So um, I would firstly like to just ask a couple of questions to our panel. Uh, sorry, firstly, just like to remind everyone of the online Q&A portal, um, which is on your screen or should be on your screen shortly. Um, so you can submit questions there through the pigeonhole. And also, please continue the discussion on social media with the hashtag Cybercon. And then welcome to our panel members. So uh, firstly, a couple of questions here to lead off with, with relevance to the topic today. I think one of the biggest ones, I guess, to follow straight on from David is um, if I could go to Anthony. So Anthony, obviously one of the things here um, post-incident is, as David talked about, the reaction from the community and government. What advice would you have for an organisation where um, they've had such an incident and, I guess, given your expertise from a communications perspective? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I think that... Um we shouldn't underestimate this. This is this is incredibly common. Uh, in fact, you know, according to government figures, about sixty-five percent of Australian businesses over the last twelve months have been disrupted in some way by by cybercrime. So it it, it impacts um, many of us, and it's something that we really have to prepare for. And I think you think about um, the COVID nineteen crisis and any type of crisis. It's it's the same kind of communication that needs to occur in this kind of crisis and in talking about um, and I think uh, David was talking about a home invasion. So this is the type of way that people really think about their personal information if it's released. Obviously um, companies think that way but imagine you're holding personal information um, as a company and that's what happened for people like uh, British Airways in two, 2018 where half a million credit card details were released or Canva last year where 139 million user information kind of was released to the public. That's the, that's the scale of, of, of information that can be released. And you can imagine that most um, people, when they find that their personal information has been released due to cybercrime, are going to react quite um, emotionally and negatively towards your company. So in terms of uh, communicating when you're the company that's been um, compromised, uh, it's really important, I think, just to, to understand that emotion, that just how much information is being released, the fact that people usually have one password for, for everything. And so if a password is released, then it kind of has that knock-on effect. It's, it's, they're quite emotionally charged events. So in terms of companies communicating, I think it's really important to, to, to be authentic, um, you know, be human, act human, use senior people. Um, and, you know, obviously understand that people are worried about themselves and not you. Uh, so if, if you feel like you've been compromised and it's, you've been, your system's been invaded, think about also how they feel. They're not really worried about you. In fact, they think that you've let them down in some way in releasing that information. Um, be transparent. I think one of the things that happens in these kinds of incidents is that you want to get all the information. You want to know how this has happened. You want to know who's done it. And you don't communicate until you've got that information. That's probably the worst thing to do. As you can see with uh, coronavirus, for instance, people want information constantly. They want it now. They want to have as much information as you can give them. So, if, you know, I think in those kinds of instance, instances, and, you know, you have to be considering um, giving as much information as you can, learn to, and, and share that um, as frequently as you can, because you're talking about information that um, has been compromised and they're very, they're very worried about. So I think that's important. I think another thing which is important is obviously speed. Uh, and we've talked about how fast these situations move. So um, being able to communicate quickly, ensuring that you've got an approval process in place that allows you to communicate publicly very, very quickly as well. Great, thank you for that. Um, Jeff, if I could go to you um, as a more of an operational cyber security expert, what, what things are you seeing at the moment and what uh, ideas, tips, help would you, advice would you give in light of uh, increased threat at the moment in terms of what safeguards um, in general you would recommend? 
Um, I think we're seeing the, the gamut. So we're getting uh, constantly seeing attacks from nation states. Um, you, your people just doing your normal scans, trying to find vulnerabilities in your external systems or web facing systems. So I guess for us, um, embrace a framework. So for us, it was the Essential Act and some of the Australian energy sector cybersecurity framework um, controls. Now, you can always separate those up into your technical controls and your people and process controls. And in October in 2019, uh, we conducted uh, or took part in a national exercise called GridX, which was a simulated cyber attack across the electricity subsector. And, and it was interesting to see the learnings come out of that and, um, and what, um, how particular respondents responded to specific actions. Some of the feedback we got internally from some of our um, business divisions was things like, oh, it would have been uh, good to have more notice um, uh, if, when, when this was occurring. But I think what I'd like to reiterate is you don't get a lot of notice. These things just happen uh, quite quickly and, and breaches of, of your internal network, as, as David has pointed out. So Essential 8, we, I mean, we've had implemented multi-factor authentication for a while now. Um, to protect all our external facing systems as well as our internal systems uh, um, from a systems perspective. Make sure you've got a good patching regime across both your OS and your third party applications. A lot of people tend to miss the third party application space, um, but you'll see um, a lot of attacks being perpetrated from that. Um, good culture and awareness. So have you got a good security awareness program in place for your staff and employees that also can extend to their home life? and position it in such a way that it's easy to consume. Um, then we've also got things like um, making sure that all our security systems or all our core systems actually have the appropriate logging enabled so that post instant incident, you can actually go back and uh, potentially do a forensic deep dive and understand actually what's happened and, and what's, uh, uh, what's been potentially been stolen, whether that's data or IP or, or a combination of both. Um, so those simple things, and they don't cost a lot, as David has pointed out. Um, getting your board and your executive up to speed and understanding what's actually important in terms of criticality of service. So from an operational perspective, Horizon Power look after um, supply of high quality, reliable electricity regional WA. So customers making sure that they have that safe, reliable provision of services across that domain. And making sure that if those services actually do uh, do break down, we have manual backup procedures um, that we can revert to. Making sure that your backup process is, is, is correct, because I think the way we've provisioned our board and our executive is that it's not an, uh, a case of if, but when, and testing those backup procedures so that if all your systems are actually breached and compromised and you can't get them back, you can at least restore to a point in time where you're confident that you can get those critical systems back up again. So that's just a few things. Great, some really, uh, really, really great tips in there, Jeff. Thanks for that. Um, and across the board from the, you know, the technical to the far more important, not so technical. Um, of course, we've talked about the challenge here so far today, but of course we're here um, with CEDA. And so the opportunity is also important to talk about. So if Rochelle, if I could ask you to give a brief overview of the size scale of the cyber business opportunity from your perspective in Sapien. Uh, Rochelle, I'll just get you to unmute your mic. The, the opportunity is a global opportunity for here, us here in WA and um, broadly across Australia in terms of the cybersecurity industry. Um, we're seen as a trusted provider that, um, and, or exporter of cybersecurity expertise. And so what we're seeing, particularly now with COVID-19, broadening what we would um, call the cyber threat exposure of companies to now encompass home networks, organisations are really wanting um, a level of visibility across their entire enterprise. The understanding, much like David showed with the example of the home, um, to in real time understand when a potentially a malicious third party is trying to gain access to your network, that front door or any system have visibility across all of your systems in the network um, and understanding exactly 
every single device that could be a potential um, vulnerability or exploit for a malicious third party is becoming increasingly critical. And certainly COVID-19 has caused somewhat of an intersection between um, what we're seeing in terms of the broader community and cyber security and increased level of awareness by companies that they really need that level of visibility. They need to understand now, particularly with people now accessing the networks from home, how they are accessing those networks, are the proper processes and protocols in place, what kinds of devices they are accessing their networks on. Not everyone can have a corporate um, device at home in which to access networks. We are also opening a company networks up to the vulnerabilities of home networks. It is still possible for a compromised home network through VPN connection into a corporate network to introduce an attack. So it's critical that visibility is um, uh, something companies have. And as David said, that's something they found very important for them um, moving forwards in terms of establishing a solid cybersecurity strategy around their systems. Beyond that, though, in terms of um, uh, opportunity, we're also seeing the opportunity to partner with like organisations. We have a really robust collaborative industry here in WA. And so coll collaborating in a way that brings complementary services together so we can truly provide a multi-dimensional comprehensive solution to partners or to clients, I should say, that removes the complexity of managing cybersecurity in what is a rapidly evolving threat landscape. We're now seeing, um, you know, Gartner recommends uh, or states around $6 trillion will be the cost to the global economy with respect to cybersecurity. And I think we've We've opened up those opportunities of cyber criminals further as many companies have rapidly transitioned into to a digital transformation of the provision of services and products to the broader community as a response to COVID-19 and having to go to remote work arrangements. So from a broader perspective, the opportunity really is for companies or organisations like our own to be there to offer advice solid advice and recommendations and contextualised advice, I think is the critical point specific to each organisation's requirements and their concerns. So um, very much um, a broadening opportunity and one um, I think collaboratively we can all work towards assisting um, those companies out there that are very concerned about their threat exposure today. Great, thanks Rochelle. Uh, and on a related note, Ian, if I could ask you about the cybersecurity ecosystem from a, a commercial perspective, not just in Western Australia, but Australia more broadly, in your role as the WA OS Cyber Hub lead. Very good. Uh, my, my focus is definitely on the small to medium enterprise sector in terms of economic resilience and economic maintenance of Australia at the moment. As we know, if you're working from home or you're dialing in, as Michelle said, then the problem is a lot of SMEs um, don't even know that they're subject of attack. Um, so in terms of the almost asymptomatic, so the, that's the problem here with vulnerability that um, a lot of small businesses who have to transact now, uh, you know, online don't have their home router configured properly. They don't know how to do it. Um, there's not a VPN that they're tunneling through, et cetera, et cetera. So, the other problem is that within Australia, and it's a horrible number, but about $1,200 per small business in Western Australia, or in Australia, um, was a spend on IT, um, historical spend on IT. So that's really just a computer and maybe a modem. Um, and as for David's business and, and other businesses, the problem is the compromise of the supply chain. If somebody wants to get into David's network, um, but then if he's fortified and he's got locks on every door and window, the problem is that you go down the supply chain to the unauthenticated third parties, as, as people have said, that don't have proper protections, but they're sending malicious files and they don't even know it. So once you um, compromise any part of the supply chain, you can get into David's network in the past. Hopefully he's fortified enough at his front door. Thing I've been working on um, the last month or so it's kind of my sharp focus and has been brought on this is an economic impact model for what if uh, small businesses around Australia are compromised and we know you know depending how you model things but uh, cost per event is maybe seven thousand dollars up thirty eight thousand dollars there are any number you pick a number out of the sky 
in terms of the damage to that business. The problem that we don't understand while we're trying to protect jobs is that for the business continuity around Australia, we have to keep our phones working, we have to keep sending invoices, we have to keep receiving orders, we have to keep um, delivering what we're doing. Once that's compromised, there's a cost per attack, but as Rochelle and others said, there's a downside to all of the other businesses that now can't deal with us because they can't get in touch with us, et cetera, et cetera. So the model that I've built is kind of looking at cybercrime costs as a percentage of gross state product. So this goes across all of Australia. It looks at the zero to 19 employee range of business, which is most of Australia, 95% of Australia. It looks at um, the numbers of businesses experience attack and um, Somebody said 60%, I think Anthony did. But, you know, I, even in this model, at the lowest base case of 10% of Australian companies being attacked online, which they will be, you could model 30%, 60%, whatever number, it would show that for every million dollars that was given to the national network, for example, for our cyber and for Western Australia to run um, small business health checks, um, securitization of the supply chain. And this is just, we used to do this in, um, online uh, in, uh, with... Um, small businesses called Cyber Check Me in Western Australia, and that was one-on-one -on -one consults. We're now migrating to online consults because we have to. But the point is, every million dollars that uh, government or somebody invests in this, we can probably save between four and six million of productivity, or not making well, making sure that business is not lost. So that's the type of thing that we also need to understand in this environment where. Um, there's a national network of small businesses that feed into medium enterprises that feed into large businesses. Once you compromise that whole chain, um, there's serious issues for Australia still trying to do business in the way that it thought it, that it could. Great. Thanks, Ian. Okay, um, Paddle, I've got uh, a number of questions here, a significant number of questions from our wonderful audience today. And so I'm going to could jump straight to the top one here from Nick Jenkins. How seriously do you think Australian entities take their reporting responsibilities under the notifiable data breach scheme? And why haven't we seen more disclosures? And in particular, kudos to David in terms of uh, actually reporting it. So is anyone in particular panel would like to jump onto that one? Yep, I, I could speak quickly because we're currently going through that assessment at the moment. Great, thanks, Jeff. So, so I think the biggest problem for WA has there uh, for a long time is there really hasn't been a privacy regime that's been mandated. You know, we've got our Australian Privacy Principles and our Privacy Act, um, and and I think we've been scared in the past to share information or breach information um, because it would uh, this perception about being compromised. But I think. Um, I'm starting to see a, an increase. So I think organisations are starting to take this seriously. And so when we start to share information like this about breaches, um, I think we've got long gone past the day where we can deal with this individually. So forums like this where we can share information, uh, talk about similar controls and common approaches uh, will, uh, I guess, better aid us in the future to adopt more of that notifiable data breach scheme. And, and the implications of that as, as, a, as an industry. Great. Uh, question here from Fleur. What do you think are the top three cyber learning areas to focus our attention on in terms of security education awareness and training? So uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the phishing exercise uh, kind of question, but what other things would you suggest that people focus on? All right. Um, uh, I'll, ju I'll yeah. jump in. Um, All right. <laughs> um, so from a people perspective, um, right now, COVID-19 is forcing a lot of people into uh, work from home arrangements that are unfamiliar. Um, they've lost the ability of having that peer to sit next to them to ask, does this look okay to you when they're looking at a potential malicious email or communication? We're being forced into communicating with each other in different ways. And so, you know, cyber criminals are very adaptive and reactive and they will use this uncertainty against us. Um, they will almost weaponise it in many respects. Also weaponising our desire for more information about COVID-19 as a potential attack vector. Sending emails, for example, that purport to be from the WHO organisation with the latest updates, health updates on COVID-19. 
So on a broader level, I think for pe- your, your people who really, when they're working from home, and I think it was Carl Hanmore actually from the Australian Cybersecurity Centre who said, you need to treat people as your human firewall now. And I think that's a very valid point to make. So it's consistent modalities of training for your people, changing it up, you know, testing them with a phishing email, giving them awareness of the types of attacks that they can now expect to see that are both broad but also sector specific, I think is very important as well. Clear, contextualised advice for your people on how you will as now as a company when they're working from home, communicate with each other. So that if they get a financial communication on a different format or using a different forum, they're more than likely going to question, well, actually, is this legitimate or not? It's giving them those processes. I think that the critical thing is the three pillars. Technology, people and processes are critical. And unfortunately, a lot of organisations focus on the technology at the expense of people and processes. So it's very important. We have the processes in place, the training and awareness programs in place to support our people who are now working under you know, stressful circumstances in a different work environment and in a different way. So at a broader level, they would be certainly my recommendations. Great, thanks Rochelle. Uh, this one's always a, a hot topic question. I'll have you from Richard. The Deloitte VMware Cyber Smart Index today shows a significant growing deficit for cyber skills. What policy strategies can be implemented to overcome the skill shortage? And if I could perhaps ask each panelist to give a really short response to that question, uh, given the time and also the fact that it's a pretty broad topic. If I could start with uh, Rochelle on my screen. Sorry, Andrew, could you repeat the question? You broke up for me a little bit then. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question really is around uh, overcoming the cyber skill shortage strategies policies in, you know, 25 words or less. Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, we benefit from co-location at one of the top um, cyber security centres of um, academic excellence at ECU. And we've very much focused on that as somewhat of a way to buffer ourselves in terms of the cyber security skills shortage um, with the fantastic graduate program right through full bachelor's, master's and PhD offered by ACU, as well as a cybersecurity training program at North Metropolitan TAFE across the road. Um, for us, we've um, uh, started internship program. We very much participate in the Work Grad Learning Program at ECU. From a broader level, though, for companies struggling to find people, I think that's where uh, companies like ourselves and others out there offering services as an outsourcing um, uh, opportunity for organisations will also be critical, where we can support a smaller team by removing some of the complexity and some of the, uh, you know, uh, overlying and often intensive requirements of managing cybersecurity for an organisation to support the team they have in-house. So um, that is certainly a focus of our, ourself moving forward as in terms of provision for clients. Well, uh, fortunately, because your answer was a bit longer, that um, has uh, good and bad. The good is it was a good long answer. The bad is we're now unfortunately out of time. So uh, the other panellists are now off the hook for that question. So uh, thank you all. Thank you to our audience for providing some really up questions that I have on my screen. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to get to all of them. Thank you to all our panellists for providing some really great insight and some great answers. And I would like, now like to hand back to Paula to close the event. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to David Singleton, Jeff Campbell, Rochelle Fleming, Anthony Fisk, Dr. Ian Martinez, and Professor Andrew Woodward for facilitating the outstanding Q&A. I certainly think there was a lot of content that we could have carried on for the afternoon talking about, but I really appreciate the honesty and integrity that you all showed, especially David, in opening up um, your kind of um, story to a, an Australian wide audience. Thank you also to our major sponsor, Edith Cowan University, ECU. Um, please also note that you can still post additional questions to the online portal and access the poll for the next 15 minutes. And we will post selected responses in our post event email. The post event email will also include a link to the video for this live stream and any speaker presentations. I also encourage you to register for CEDA's next live stream events. 
On the 2nd of April, we have the Ethics of Decision-Making in a Crisis. And on the 8th of April, the Annual Resources Overview with Amanda Lacaz, the CEO from Lioness Corporation. To find out more, visit CEDA's website at cedar.com.au. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been wonderful sharing this conversation and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.